Today is, uh, is a truly special day for me that typifies the York that I love, which is it's all about big ideas, big minds, big hearts, big ambition, and big future. And it's all about the Mercia Lecture as well. The Mercia Lecture was established more than 10 years ago, uh, and it was a precursor to what we currently call uh, Renaissance engineering. It was uh, established to unify, in a sense, uh, the worlds of science and technology, engineering, and commerce. You will hear um, from Madame Mercier later on about uh, what it means to her and what it meant to her when she established the, the lecture itself. Now, uh, this year, it's, uh, it's something new for the lecture because we are, interact we are including the lecture in, uh, in our program that we call BEST. It stands for Bergeron Entrepreneurs in Science and Engineering. That's the program that was established oh, thanks to the donation. Uh, uh, well, it, it, it means that uh, some wireless communication is working. Uh, uh, and uh, why it, the best was established uh, by our alumnus, um, Doug Bergeron, who lives now in, in Silicon Valley. So we, we with, with a similar premise as the one that uh, the, lecture, um, uh, the lecture is uh, embodying itself. Now, it's very important also uh, that, uh, to know that this wireless connection is working because uh, uh, for the first time, we will, we will be able to uh, ask questions via Twitter. And for the first time, we have a live feed um, uh, all over the world. So people in the city, in the country and uh, in the world will be able to, to see what's happening uh, tonight. For those of you who are with us here, you can ask uh, questions in a more traditional way that you know, or um, uh, you can ask questions using uh, Akash. Uh, that's the product that our guest will be very likely talking about. Believe me, it's really cool. And, uh, and I really wanted to thank you and uh, Madame Mercier for donating uh, quite a few of, of those tablets so students in La Sonde will be able to uh, learn more about them and most importantly, learn how to use it. So please uh, use, it, it's, uh, it's a hashtag Mercier lecture that you can use and uh, ask those questions uh, during the question um, uh, period. Now, I'm, I'm also uh, very pleased to share with you that uh, our today's speaker is also uh, a Lassondian, uh, because he is a parent of uh, our first year student in computer engineering. And uh, I hope uh, um, that your son was attracted to, to Lassonde for uh, uh, the purpose of changing the world the same way as, as, as you, you're doing and the, same, the way that we will be learning about it uh, from you. Now, um, it is true that Mercier Lecture was well ahead of its time when it was established. Now, so the, the main purpose of it was to uh, create a bridge between uh, the worlds of technology, scientific discovery, um, the business, and commerce. And it was the brainchild of our good friend, um, Eileen Mercier, um, and what I would like to do is uh, invite uh, Eileen to say a few words about uh, uh, the lecture itself, what it means to you, and what it means particularly to, to the young generation that is uh, uh, fulfilling this, the, the, their, pre their promise of uh, uh, knowledge for the future in our, at our university. So please, Eileen, join us. Now, so uh, um, uh, Eileen is one of the uh, Canada's preeminent uh, corporate directors. Uh, I looked it up and I learned that she served on 28 boards of a variety of companies, uh, small companies and, and congl conglomerates. Um, uh, and and I, I'm serving on two and I know how difficult it is. So, so she will be able to share her secret with us very likely as well. She is an outgoing uh, 
uh, chair of the Ontario Teachers' Pension Plan, and uh, perhaps, most importantly, she was voted um, one of Canada's most influential women. Um, and it is, again, very important to us because for the school, like ours, the Lasson School, that prides itself on, on uh, uh, having an ambition to be a number one choice uh, in Canada uh, of engineering for female students, that, that me means to us uh, uh, tremendously. Eileen has also been um, associated with York University um, because she was the uh, vice chair of the Board of Governors and uh, you are now the honorary um, the governor, um, uh, Eileen, uh, received MBA degree from the Schulich School of Business and uh, she received uh, an honorary doctorate of laws in, uh, back in 2010. So, uh, Dr. Mercier, <laughs> voila. Thank you. Um, I stand between you and the speaker, so I'm going to be very brief. Um, when I did my MBA here at Knights, it was a very, very long time ago. It was before the name that Schillick, of Schillick was even thought of uh, to put on the school. It was still the School of Administrative Studies, which sounds very old-fashioned and very boring. But, uh, but this, uh, this school did a lot for me. Um, I, had, I had had six years of university before that in an arts program. I was, I was in English and I had a master's degree and I was beginning to teach. And I decided I wanted to do something different with my life and I came here to do an MBA. So, uh, so the, the School of Business here has been very important to me. And then when I became a governor of the university as a whole, I learned a lot more about what else the university was about and uh, became even more impressed. When my uh, late husband died in 2002, he was a chemical engineer and uh, had ended his career as a banker. All of this is on the website, so I'm not going to take a lot of time over it. But um, I was trying to think of something to do that would please him, that would have pleased him, that would have made him feel good about, uh, about something that had his name attached to it. And it struck me that uh, a lot of what he had done in his career was to take his scientific background and try and use uh, that to inform his business career. And so I thought back then that it was the thing to do was to be to try to bring the science faculties and the business faculties together at least once a year in a way that would make them see how important they need to be to one another for the future. And when you look at what Canada needs today, it's certainly more of that. Uh, we need to have more good science, more interesting futuristic things here, and we need to have them married to a very practical way to how to become sustainable and how to be companies that will last over the long run. So uh, this lecture was born out of that idea. This is the 10th one. We have not had one every year since we started. There were a couple of years when things got pushed a little bit uh, sideways. But I have to say that uh, since uh, Dean Kaczynski and the Lasson School has started up with the stated intention of becoming much closer to other faculties within the university, and specifically commerce and law, that this has provided us with a natural home uh, so the lecture kind of floats. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it's, uh, its home is really uh, a joint venture between Schulich and the engineering school. Uh, the engineering people uh, have helped me to organize it and I want to thank them very much. There's two or three of them here who've really been great about putting this together. And today, we've, we, as, uh, as the dean was saying, we're, we're going to do a little technical experiment at the same time. And so I hope everyone enjoys it. Um, uh, I, I'm sure you will, and uh, I'm looking forward to the talk myself, and, uh, and looking forward to the time when it won't seem uh, so, uh, so futuristic as a thought that people would actually work together uh, to come to bring this to fruition at York and in Canada as a whole. So um, with that, I'd like to call on Dr. James McKellar, who's the Executive Director of the Real Estate and Infrastructure Program and the Executive Director, External Relations at Schillick, to say a few words. Our guest asked if I could keep things short, and uh, I will, because uh, I'm not going to repeat some things that were said before. Um, first of all, I just, uh, I'd like to thank, on behalf of, of the Dean and the school, 
uh, Eileen Mercier um, for this um, uh, lecture. Uh, it's a very important part of the culture of the school and that certainly reflects the interdisciplinarity that she's trying to, uh, or has established, I should say. Uh, and, and so we hope that uh, in some small way, each of these lectures, and particularly the one tonight, uh, will uh, promote um, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, among our students. Now I'm speaking on behalf of the Dean and there's a good news and bad news story. Uh, the good news is my speech will be a lot shorter <laughs> And those who know the Dean would know that. Uh, the bad news is that, that it's very difficult to capture the enthusiasm, the passion uh, that the Dean has. And so you'll have to forgive me for that. I'll, I'll do the best I can under the circumstance. Uh, if you know the Dean, the, uh, the question is, where is he? And that's really one of which country is he in right now. I, I think it's India, um, if, if I'm not incorrect. He's in India. Um, I don't know if he knows about the hashtag, but um, we don't want a question from him anyway. Uh, so um, it, it, this whole question of innovation and, and entrepreneurship is, is very uh, important to the school. And uh, last year we brought on board our first um, entrepreneur or in residence, uh, Chris Carter. Uh, he was a senior executive uh, in innovation with the consulting firm Kinetic Cafe Inc. and co-founder of Thin Data. And he's been working with our students and coaching them. And uh, perhaps in the future, we'll have one of our students up here giving the Mercier Lecture. Uh, so we're really honored to have our guest, Sunit Singh Thule, speak. And I should also mention that we're also honored to have his parents here who traveled a long way to get here from Mississauga, I believe. Um, so welcome to the Schulich School. Uh, th this, uh, this gentleman, um, uh, Sunit, is really a, uh, an, an inspiration uh, to uh, our students. And uh, he's someone who has founded a company and kept that in Canada, kept the company in Canada, and, and continues to do uh, his R&D in, in Canada. So this is really a, a, an all-Canadian story. Um, I, I won't go into the details because it would be long, but the, the list of achievements and, and market penetration, et cetera, are, are, are quite formidable. I should state that I'm, I'm very committed to this topic for three reasons. Um, one is that I came from MIT and taught there for many years, and I know the importance of engineering. Um, the second is that I sat in this room uh, and heard C.K. Prahalad, and C.K. Uh, certainly has had a big influence on my thinking, and I think uh, our guest speaker would, would also indicate that this is the path of his work, and if you haven't read the work of C.K. Prahalad, every business student should read it, every engineer should read it. And thirdly, I teach a course on sustainable cities, and I actually look at, um, at the science and technology of how we are going to provide the infrastructure uh, for a growing urban population, particularly in uh, the developing world. So I have a direct interest uh, in this topic, and certainly um, the, the work of our guest is a part of that infrastructure. Um, so uh, I, I would, uh, before we call our guest to the stage, I believe there's a short video, is that correct? We'll have that. Ninety percent of them in developing countries still work. Almost two-thirds of people on our planet, 90% of them in developing countries, still work, study and communicate without access to the web. Facebook says the main barrier is not the price of a smartphone, but the high cost of buying a data plan. Data when Sunit Singh Thule believes the answer is to get devices into the hands of people. We're making the UV Slate devices affordable for the 
forgotten billion people in India by focusing on what we refer to as the technology of the good enough. Would the experience of the original iPad be good enough for the average person? Initially developed for India's government, DataWind's cheapest tablet costs around $40 and has the potential to revolutionize education in the developing world. Internet access is possible through Wi-Fi or traditional mobile networks by inserting a SIM card. The intent is to bring computing internet access at a level uh, that even somebody earning $200 a month can afford. Our business model focuses on recurring revenue streams more so than the hardware and because we make our own screens that allows for a lower cost product. So with that, uh, I would like to um, welcome, on behalf of York University, uh, the Lausanne School of Engineering and the Schulich School of Business, but most important on behalf of uh, Eileen's uh, sponsorship of this lecture, I will now call upon Sunit Singh Tuli to come forward. Good evening. I want to start off by thanking uh, Dr. Mercier, the team at Schulich, at Lassonde, um, and everybody who's decided to give up their evening to come. Uh, let me ramble on for a while. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to let me share with you uh, uh, the journey we're on. Uh, a few years ago, um, my sister, who had been born outside of India, made her first trip to India. This was, I think, uh, 94 or 95, um, maybe a couple of years before. And she was 15 um, and had never been to India. And she um, was really taken back by how people looked at and dealt with the poor. And she saw an incident where a car went by and there was a beggar on the roadside and went over the beggar's foot and didn't think of either stopping or slowing down because it sort of just didn't matter. She said, well, you know, they've forgotten that part of society. 70% of India lives in rural India, 70% of Indians live in rural India. About a billion people, out of 1.3 billion people, a billion people live in rural India with median monthly incomes of around $135. They're not part of the political class. They're not part of the organized workforce. They're not part of the media. They are truly a forgotten billion. And I truly believe that society has an obligation to help take them out of extreme poverty. But I'll tell you, it wasn't just the obligation part of it that motivated me. It was the opportunity part of it that motivated me. When there's an opportunity to provide a product or service 
to a billion people or multiples of billions of people, that's what we entrepreneurs look for. I'd been lucky enough to have done two ventures prior to starting this one, both of them that went public on the NASDAQ. And with this one, we really wanted something that would have broad impact. We don't want to create a company that would get to 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars in revenue and we'd make a few bucks out of it. We wanted to figure out how could we have a really broad impact. To understand sort of the point of pain or the problem we're trying to solve, let me sort of give you some highlights of India's education, educational system. Today, according to the government, there's 220 million kids in school. And you get different figures depending on which study you look at. A study about three or four years ago put out these figures that showed that grades five to eight, 43 percent of the kids drop out of school. And those that get past grade eight and get to high school, 68 percent of them don't get through high school. And if you extrapolate that, potentially there's 360 million kids that should be in school. 140 million kids are not in school that should be in school. Almost four or five times the population of Canada. Now those figures, depending on which government agency you, you talk to, are either exaggerated or, or not even all the way there. But more recently, about two weeks ago, a study came out that did an analysis of about 560,000 students. And remember, this is not looking at the kids that are not in school. Of the kids that are in school, they said as much as 25% of grade 8 kids can't read grade 2 texts. And I don't know how many of you have any interaction with very young kids, but it went down to say that 11% of grade three kids, oh sorry, grade two kids, couldn't recognize numbers up to nine. And remember, in education, it's not just about the best of the best. It's about no child left behind. It's, it's that bottom that really matters. That's the one that you can't forget because in a place like India, 10% or something is 100 million plus people, right? Um, and what the study highlighted was that your economic strata, your economic class determines the quality of education your kids receive. And I think that that's wrong. That shouldn't be the case. The quality of education should not be linked to personal wealth at all. If you've not heard of a fellow by the name of Professor Sugata Mitra, I'd really recommend when you have time to go on YouTube and search for hole in the wall experiments. There's a professor in India who started doing these experiments, went into villages where they didn't speak English, had never seen a computer, and took a generator, took a computer, put it inside a shed, and put a camera behind it to see just what would happen. But he did a very interesting study where he took a standardized math test and he gave it to students around New Delhi and the marks were in the mid 60s. Then he went out 100, 120 kilometers and 150 and 200 and 250 kilometers with that same test. And he drew this little chart that showed that the further he went out, the lower the marks. And this is not just a problem in Canada, in India. This is an issue here. The best quality teachers migrate to the big cities. They don't migrate to the small native communities out in parts of Canada that most of us will never see. And that creates a big challenge for large governments trying to resolve the issue of education. In fact, <coughs> one statistic that I saw said that a third of all schools in rural India on any given day have no teachers. A third have zero teachers. So remember, we were talking about the kids that are not in school. Now we're talking about the kids that are in school 
and the quality education that they receive. <clears throat> and we believe that the best, fastest way to impact this, that is improve the quality of education, is through computers and internet access. The most powerful tool that humanity has ever created, access to the largest library content inf information that ever was. And the difficulty is, is very large. Uh, the, the difficulty in trying to get it to those people is very significant, but the implementations are very easy. In fact, one of the things that we push is this concept of a flipped classroom, where teachers, instead of lecturing, become coaches and do the practical work in the class, and students watch lectures outside of class on YouTube or, or cached video and so on. There's been a debate for many years on the role of computers in classrooms. And um, somebody said that, uh, well, I'm not sure that uh, teachers will get replaced by computers, but teachers that don't use computers will certainly get replaced by teachers that do use computers. And that's the reality in that environment. But the access to that computer allows and empowers the student and the teacher in ways that wasn't possible before. And I'll share with you a quick anecdote. I remember a few years ago when my six-year-old daughter was printing out stuff on plate tectronics, and I said, this seems a little advanced for what you are doing in school. Is this, why are you printing this out? And she said, well, the teacher mentioned something and I knew she was wrong, so I Googled it, so I'm taking it to her to show her that she was wrong. <laughs> and I said, well, geez, how, how did you discover that? Uh, you know, well, why did you know, this, know about this? She said, well, I was was watching on Discovery Channel. It was a great video, it was multimedia, she absorbed it, she understood the concept, and she was empowered by the internet to be able to challenge something that was being taught. And that empowers teachers, empowers students, and improves the quality of education much faster than India will try to will figure out how to get absentee re rates of teachers resolved, dropout rates, and, and so on. But education is one area. Certainly, the biggest impact the internet has is on commerce. There's no commerce in this part of the world that happens without the internet. But in India, millions and millions and millions of businesses still have no relation to the internet. And when I do this talk in India, or versions of this talk in India, I show them this statistic, that a country of 1.2 or 1.3 billion people generates $184 billion worth of exports. But one little website, well, not little, but one website in China called Alibaba.com generates about $60 billion more in transactions than what the whole Indian economy does in exports. That's the power of the internet. Except the reality is that the penetration of the internet in India is minuscule. Uh, and, and don't believe all the studies you see. Most recently, the studies tell us that there's about 220 million people in India that use the internet. Now, out of 1.2 billion, that's still a minuscule number, but the problem is that when you read these studies a little further, they tell you that the number of people that use the internet in India at least once a week is only about 45 million. Now, if you don't use it even once a week, you're not using the internet, right? And if I don't check emails or any urgencies at least three or four times during this lecture, then I, you'll start seeing me shake and you'll start going through withdrawal symptoms. So, so most of us that use the internet are, are, are much more avid users than once a week. But the people, number of people that use it at least once a week in India is 45 million. 4% of the population. The remaining 1.2 billion people don't use the internet at all, or barely at all. And we all know what the impact is. The impact is not just what we see on a daily basis. I was at a conference uh, that's held by 
a fellow by the name of Carl Bildt, who, who's the former Prime Minister of Sweden, is the current Foreign Minister of Sweden. He holds an annual conference called the Internet Freedom Conference. And um, there was a professor from an African country who asked a question after the panel I was on. And he said, you know, this whole thing about the Internet, you know, until you solve the core problems in our countries, until we get democracy and we get rid of the dictators and the rest of it, uh, the rest of this, this internet bit isn't very useful. And I said, yeah, but did you forget the Arab Spring, where people communicated using social networking and were able to overthrow a dictator in Egypt because of the power of the internet? We have an NGO uh, who I won't name uh, for, for a variety of reasons in Afghanistan that smuggles devices into people's homes and teaches mothers that have never stepped into a classroom how to deliver educational content to their kids because those mothers are too afraid to send their daughters to school. Malala user size is, is you know, known worldwide now, but you regularly get cases of acid being thrown at girls or other uh, violent incidents because parents dared to send their daughters to school. Now, after many, many years, the US armed forces have pulled out. Uh, Canada is in the process of pulling out, and so on and so on. And the security issues at that place aren't resolved. And who's going to pay for that? Those girls. Those families that want to make sure that their daughters get educated will have the biggest issue with this. And the internet empowers them in ways that is not possible any other way and empowers them today. You don't need to wait years for things to happen. The question is, how do you do it? How do you get it to those people? And the traditional answers as to why most people around the world, two-thirds of the world's population still doesn't use the internet, are one, well, the lack of electricity. If you look at the world map, a satellite image at night, you see Africa without a lot of light, and it's referred to as the dark continent. You say, ah, oh, that's it. That's why they don't use the internet. There's no electricity. Well, there are over 5 billion people around the world with 6 billion mobile phone connections. And if you've got a mobile phone connection, you've got figured out how to charge that phone, so electricity is certainly not the barrier. And then they say, well, the networks don't exist. How do you deliver internet to those people? You know, Google's got these balloons, and Facebook's going to do these drones, and great. Those would certainly help. Except those same five people that are using cell phones are using some sort of a network to connect on those phones. So neither of those two reasons exist. But this chart gave us a little bit of a clue. In fact, in the late 90s, the number of internet users and cell phone users around the world was about the same, maybe a 20% differential. And after the turn of the century, the gap between the two started to increase. And today, that gap is 4.5 billion people. 4.5 billion people are using mobile phones but are not on the internet. And why did that gap happen? And the reason that gap happened is that the cost of a mobile phone dropped so that it became affordable for those masses and the cost of the computer did not drop. In our opinion, that's all that it took. In fact, we started to do some internal study to see if that was really true. And we said, well, let's look at the PC market in India, in the US. When did PCs really take off? When was the inflection point for PC deployment in the US? And what we discovered was it happened sometime around 1998 or 99, when the cost of the average PC dropped below $1,000. And for the target customer, it was within one week of salary. And it took off. And we said, hey, does that apply in India? Does that, you know, is that possible in that market? And mobile phone penetration in India stagnated for many years until about 2007 or so. And the cost of a mobile phone dropped to about 35 bucks average, and it, mobile phone penetration went through the roof. It went from 50 million subscribers to 900 million subscribers in less than five years. And the trigger, in our opinion, 
was that the cost dropped to that level. In fact, if I look at that pyramid on the side that talks about the number of Indian families at these two bottom levels, about 200 million Indian families, about a billion people, have median family income of $135. So a week of salary is the trick. You've got to figure out, how, can you create computers for 35 bucks? Now, a few years ago that seemed outrageous. Today we're at about 25. By the summer we think we'll be at 20. And in essence, I believe it's already hitting this concept of free. People say, well, it can't ever be free. But when you think of hardware and you think of free, what, what it means is that the cost of customer acquisition for some other industry is more than the cost of the hardware. So we have a tax planner in the US who does your taxes. For $149, he does your taxes and gives you a free tablet. Uh, we are seriously negotiating with a large pizza chain in the US who believes that the moment we get down to $17, $18, then by the time you know, they give you that little card where the stamp, you've received a pizza, and the 10th time you've bought a pizza, they give you a free pizza. That the 10th time you do that, they'll give you a tablet with an app that allows you to order more pizza. <laughs> so it's free. It's getting to that stage where, in essence, it's free. But can you create something that is good enough, that is appropriate enough for that customer? Um, I, and, and will that solve the purpose? It'll solve one of two big issues. We believe the other big issue certainly is the issue of network. Today, the average Indian mobile network gives you a speed of 20 kilobits per second. Okay? What that means is the CNN page would take you about a minute and a half. And even the guy who only earns 135 bucks a month doesn't wait a minute and a half for any page to download. Nobody has that patience. In fact, the situation isn't improving. Um, in 2007, I think, is when India auctioned off 3G spectrum. We're today eight years later, and only 20% of the geography is covered by 3G. The rest of the geography still is delivering only 20 kilobits per second in throughput. So that's the other big challenge. And unfortunately, India hasn't done a great job in attracting telecom investment over the last few years. So the upgrades to those networks may take some time. We decided that we'd work on it a little differently. Most people try to figure out what their competition is when they create product and try to figure out how to beat that competition. We just had no competition. We said, well, this is our price point, and if we work backwards from our price point, can we create a product that is good enough to meet our requirements. Again, here is a recommendation. If you've not read Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma uh, and you're an entrepreneur, I, I'd really recommend that, uh, uh, that, that you take advantage of this book. Clayton Christensen talked about this concept of the disruption of the good enough. And one of the things he showed, and he showed this in multiple industries, th is that the performance expectation of the high end of the market when you compare the performance expectation to the low end of the market, not only does the higher end product exceed those expectations, over time, even the lower end product exceeds the performance expectations of the high end of the market. And I ask you, uh, can, can, if I can have a show of hands, how many of you have iPads? Right? Lots of you. Okay. How many of you have uh, iPads? that are more than 18 months old. Almost half of those that raise their hands, your iPads are more than 18 months old. By the way, my $25 device has more horsepower than those iPads. Uh, except 18 months old, it didn't. And I'll, I'll, again, this is not to imply that we're competing against the iPad or we're taking customers away from Apple. We're not in the same league, um, except if I can show you how the differential in horsepower has grown over the last few years, when we introduced our first version of the product, 
we were using an ARM 11 366 megahertz processor with 256 megabytes of RAM. And the first iPad had a Cortex-8 1 gig processor and 256 megabytes of RAM. And a year later, when our next version came out, it had the same level of caliber processor as the iPad and doubled the RAM. And I would go around saying, hey, to get those next billion people on board, isn't the user experience of the original iPad good enough for what we need to do? But remember, nothing stays static. The iPad 2 went to a dual core processor, and the 3 went to a gig uh, RAM. Um, and uh, currently, it's around a dual core processor with a gig of RAM. And I can manufacture today something with the same caliber processor, with the same modern RAM, for about 25 bucks. Um, it meets the expectations of not just the low end of the market, it meets the expectations of the high end of the market. Now, I'm not trying to imply that it beats all the features of the iPad, gives you the same screen resolution, gives you anywhere near the same brand, and so on and so on. But for the purposes of delivering content and applications to those masses, it is good enough. And what's very important, it overcomes the critical barrier, and that is affordability. We realized that we also had to change the business model. In fact, again, not something we invented. We just observed and applied it to that market. So as entrepreneurs, as you look at opportunities, you don't always have to recreate the wheel. Just applying it to different segments and different markets in itself can be revolutionary. What we realized was that the initial cost is much more important to our customer than what happens afterwards. And we decided to focus our profits not on the hardware, but on what happens afterwards. So less than a quarter of our profits come from hardware and hardware-related services. In fact, a lot more comes from network services and content and apps and advertising. Three quarters of our margins come from what happens afterwards. And that to us is way more powerful we discovered that Google makes much more for every user that searches on Google and doesn't pay them anything than the telecom operators in India for the same user that they collect their buck and a half or two bucks a month from. So without charging the customer anything, through advertising, even in the Indian market, you can make more money than charging them for internet access. So we decided not only should we reduce the cost of the hardware by reducing our margins and the channel's margin and focusing on what happens afterwards, but we should focus on helping develop an ecosystem around content and apps. We do about close to three dozen hackathons a year in partnerships with the universities. And the reason we do that is that we're not sure that somebody sitting in Silicon Valley will solve the problems for somebody sitting in Kolkata. Except if I can show those students how to create apps and take advantage of the internet and the power of the internet, then they may come up with some brilliant ideas to, to deal with the issues that they face. So content and apps is very important for us. And in fact, there's a greed factor for us also. We get to tie up these young developers uh, much early on, uh, much before Samsung and Apple actually discovers that those applications exist. Of course, the, the next one, which is very important, is network access. At the end of the day, all you've done is created an inexpensive device that takes a minute and a half to download a web page. I mean, how useful is that? Our background prior to this was imaging. Um, my brother today has, I don't know, 78 odd patents on a variety of technologies, very heavily focused on imaging related technologies. And because of those imaging technologies, we developed some algorithms, uh, and we have 18 years patents in, in DataWind, that reduce the bandwidth consumption by factors of about 30x, about 97%. So the CNN page, which would normally take, let's say, two megabytes, consumes only about 30, 40 kilobytes, and gives the same look, feel, and user experience that the two megabytes would give. And the moment you reduce it by such a huge factor, not only does it 
go through much faster, instead of a minute and a half or a minute, takes five seconds, but the amount of data you just consumed becomes a lot less. In fact, what we've discovered is that we can generate more in advertising revenue than is the cost of that data in that market. And if that's the case, then you can offer free internet access. You can profitably offer free internet access. Remember, we're not a charity. We're not looking for donations. We're trying to figure out how to create sustainable businesses that can be impactful. And for that to happen, they have to be profitable. So what's the impact of this? Uh, our, our experience has been uh, very positive. And, and again, not without its difficulties and challenges and the rest of it. And, and, and if you ever want, I can come back here and do hours and hours of how difficult it is and, 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 uh, and nothing's uh, 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 you know, a walk in the park. But, but here's a few slides of uh, the walk in the park bit. <coughs> Um, when we entered the Indian market, the total market was 250,000 units a year. That's it. That's the total number of tablets being sold. And Apple and Samsung dominated that market with 80% market share. And 20% was everybody else. HP, Lenovo, Acer, LG, uh, so on and so on, and lots of local Indian brands. And we were trying to find a distributor that would commit to 50,000 units a year, do 4,000 units a month for us. And everybody said, that's silly. There's, there's no way. 20% is the rest of the market. Nobody's going to touch Apple and Samsung's share. And you've got to decide out of that 20% uh, how much you're going to be able to get. Half a percent, 1%. That's the market share. We said, no, no, no. It's not the same customer. We're going after a brand new customer. This is the poor man's first computer. Uh, and we couldn't find a distributor that would agree to take this on uh, for 4,000 units a month. The Indian government, who we'd been working with, announced this project in late 2011. And within a matter of weeks, we generated about 4 million units worth of demand. Okay? Individual end users going to our website, registering, I want this product. 4 million individual end users, some of them could have wanted multiples, but 4 million individual customers. The market, in fact, grew to about 3 million the next year, and in 2013 grew to 5 million. While the PC market in India stagnated, this market grew to 20 times size in two years. And by early 2013, we became the largest supplier of tablet computers in India, outselling Apple by a factor of about four and outselling Samsung by about 10 or 15%. And since that, in the last two years, we've consistently stayed in the top two or three, depending on which quarter uh, if we're not number one, we're number two or three uh, against Samsung and a company called Micromax within that market. And a market that we'd entered trying to figure out how to place 4,000 units a month, uh, we've placed about 1.5 million in that same period of time. C.K. Prahlad, um, that was mentioned earlier, wrote a book telling us that the goal's at the bottom of the pyramid. This proves that the goal's at the bottom of the pyramid. Nobody believed that that opportunity in that market would exist. I would get people that would say, who's going to teach them? And then I'd look at my four-year-old and three-year-old, and I'd say, yeah, but nobody taught them. The reality is today's touchscreen user interfaces make it so easy that you just don't, that learning curve doesn't exist at the same level. I'll give you a quick anecdote of the difficult part of that. All we had was funding for 4,000 units a month. That's it. We had the capacity to make 4,000 units a month, and 4 million individual end users showed up on our website in a matter of a few weeks saying, I want product. And you'd think, hey, that's an easy problem to solve. You've got demand for 4 million people, $250 million worth of product you've got to deliver. Uh, and you can individually identify. It's not just a forecast. Here's the names, addresses, phone numbers of these people, and you should be able to raise funding for it. And shockingly, we couldn't. Just couldn't find capital for it. Um, so, because a lot of these venture capitalists and others would look at us and say, hey, 
Uh, how do I know they're for real? Has anybody paid? So he said, okay, let's go test that. Let's go figure out, will anybody pay in advance? The problem was that we were at least three or four months from actually building and delivering product. And now we had to go ask people if they'd pay four months ahead of time. We said, well, of the thousands of people that are still registering on our website, maybe some will. Let's see what the percentage is. And if the percentage is even 5%, then we'll extrapolate that and go to these venture capitalists and say, hey, 5% of that 4 million is still a big enough number. You know, uh, allow me uh, 5 or $10 million worth of capital so I can go make these units and deliver it to you, deliver it to the customers. <laughs> then I discovered that in India, setting up an e-commerce site isn't like here. I can't do it in 15 minutes. Uh, there are regulatory issues and it would take three or four months to do it. And remember, the, the older this database a customer gets, uh, the less valuable it is. And I'm fighting against time trying to figure out how to make these units and how to fund this, this production. So we said, well, let's start this experiment anyways, right? Let's say when, you, when people register on that site, let's put a little line at the bottom saying, by the way, thank you for registering with us. You're 4,382,418th customer. And we haven't started manufacturing yet, but, but we'll come to you. Um, but if you decide to send us payment, here's our address, uh, we'll put you front of the line. <coughs> and that was it. And we said, okay, let's see what happens. And um, but three or four days later, the fellow who headed our local office in Amritsar called me up. Uh, I was back in Canada and said, hey, I got called down to the post office and the postmaster had two policemen there and I was scolded and screamed at for a while because he had two rooms full of boxes and you've got 30 to 50,000 pieces of mail uh, that they have no idea what to do with um, and uh, they'd like you to stop that because they just don't have the resources in this local post office to handle that much mail. Um, so we took it off our website because you know when it was just somebody registering on the website, it's a different story. Now this was people sending money uh, and, and not everybody would send checks. Some would send cash, and some would send cash and not write their address on the envelope, uh, and so on. And there's, I don't know, 30 or 35,000 of these uh, that showed up in three or four days. But we said, hey, we've solved our problem. We've got money. We're going to go build product and we can move forward. Except try taking 30 to 40,000 checks to a bank in Amritsar, okay? and see what the reaction is when your two truckloads worth of checks show up at their bank. Um, they would have been much happier if we'd taken our account somewhere else. Um, and it took some convincing and we had to pull connections and try to get to head office and say, hey guys, we gotta figure out how to deposit this. And it literally took us about two and a half, three weeks before we were able to get a local bank who would accept taking those checks. Um, but they did, and we started building product, and we expanded, and we expanded. We went from about $1.2 million in revenue in the year before to $8 million in revenue the year we did this to $20 million for the year thereafter. And then we said, look, we've got to grow this to the next level, and we need funding for it. And we approached an investment banker in Canada who decided to take us public on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and we raised 30 million this last July uh, to, gra to grow this to the next level. Um, and the fun part isn't just that now we have a war chest to help grow this and, and help fulfill this, this vision, but I get a, the opportunity to come and talk to interesting folk like you and evangelize what we're doing um, apart from uh, the State Department or the White House or the Buck or Buckingham Palace in the last little while. Um, the United Nations doesn't do product launches, but Ban Ki-moon launched the product in front of 100 ambassadors, and I got to hand out devices to every ambassador to the United Nations about two years ago. Um, in fact, uh, got invited to a, to a really nice roundtable televised discussion about two weeks ago with Chancellor Merkel in Germany, um, 
and got an endorsement from her uh, saying, hey, there are schools that uh, in Germany have nothing at all. This could be something we need in Germany. Um, and it's contagious. Uh, today, the government of Mexico has decided that they will equip every child in that country with tablet computers. They've placed three million units with, with, uh, uh, with students. Some have come from us, not all, but some. Uh, the government of Turkey, there, there's a t total of 13 countries around the world that are doing very large-scale, broad deployments uh, since the start of our project in India. Um, and there's still the fun stuff about the smugglers of Afghanistan uh, who, who are doing the kind of stuff we're passionate about. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you very much. So, um, my name is Andrew Maxwell. I'm uh, delighted to be hosting Sonnet here, and uh, also to point out that not only is the uh, Alessandrian, but uh, his son is also now in, the, in our program, so we'll be delighted to have him here uh, with us. Um, as is mine, by the way. My son's also in the program. It's becoming a family business. I that my daughter has decided that Schulich is the place she wants to be, too. So, sorry. That helps. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, we've we've decided to uh, to use uh, Twitter for Q and A. Uh, that does not preclude people from uh, putting up their hands. But the reason we decided is I used to. Um, uh, do, do you want to? We could sit. Um, I guess I should sit too. Then. Um, when I, when I was uh, doing webinars uh, all the time and uh, I had streams of questions coming in on the webinars, I could pick the best questions and answer those. And then I was doing teaching large classes, and people put up their hands. And how did I know who had good questions? So I would pick people that put their hands up. And uh, that wasn't the best method. And it also was only for extroverts. So all the introverts didn't ask questions. So I switched to using Twitter in the classroom. And uh, the questions got better. And people that wouldn't normally ask questions got the chance to ask questions. So um, I have a few questions on Twitter, uh, which I will answer. If you want to tweet questions, uh, hashtag Mercier lecture uh, that will come up on my uh, tablet here. Um, I have my BlackBerry uh, with me as well, just in case people are texting me as well. So uh, we've got two ways of going to communicate. I think this, we, we both get withdrawal symptoms when we're not you know, fully connected. <laughs> my laptop's here just in case. I know uh, it's real. It's, it's <laughs> um, near. So, um, if, so if you have questions, uh, please, please uh, uh, tweet them. Um, so f first of all, I'd like to ask you, the, um, there seems to be, in the context of India, uh, this a number of gaps in uh, the technology that are going to enable uh, the internet to come. And um, you know, you have one, one piece, uh, a device. And I mean, there are limits to how fast you can grow. But you know, um, what are the other infrastructure I uh, issues? And how, how does that going to affect your business? So, so we think there are four key pieces to the puzzle. Um, first is affordable hardware. So that's the prerequisite to everything else. The, the second is network access. And we think we've solved or have a solution to both of those. We, 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 we will, apart from putting out as many devices as we can, we'll continue driving price down that, that will allow others to also have, have that impact. And uh, we've been fighting very hard with the network operators in India, uh, but we've now finalized with an operator ha that has over 110 million subscribers uh, to sell us data uh, uh, on a wholesale basis to allow us to offer free access uh, or bundled access. Uh, and and uh, we think that that'll solve the issue of, uh, of network. Um, then there's, of course, the issue of content and apps. Um, by doing the hackathons that we do, we hope that more and more will be created. But content and apps is almost a chicken and egg game. Uh, it, even if you don't believe that if you build it, they will come, the reality is they're coming with or without you building it. So you know, millions of people have it. Uh, and when millions of people have, have the product, then getting your app developed just makes that much more sense. When we do these hackathons, we run an annual competition in partnership with the United Nations uh, called Apps to Empower. And we choose the five best apps every year. And we bundle, it, then we bundle them with our devices. Uh, and we guarantee at least a, a million pre-burns. Uh, 
And if you think of, if you're an entrepreneur and you're, you're looking to get your app company off the ground, uh, a million pre-burns is a, is a relatively big deal. The number of apps that hit a million downloads uh, is minuscule. Uh, so, so hardware, uh, network services, content and apps. And the last one is training. And, and even though I believe the learning curve is very small, because our focus is around education, uh, we do a lot of work around teacher training. Uh, we're launching a course with the Canadian University in the next few months, in fact, um, uh, in India, focused on teacher training on how to develop and implement flipped classroom method, methodologies uh, and, and so on. So we'll continue efforts on all of those. But what we've discovered, and, and I think that our success so far and, and, and the growth that we're seeing, it shows that just solving those first two issues really goes a long way. Um, just social networking using Facebook and WhatsApp uh, seems to be the killer app in that environment. Uh, uh, that in itself is enough of a motivation for a lot of those people to get on board uh, because it keeps them connected in ways that they couldn't imagine before. Um, you, you've, um, you've talked a lot about <coughs> transforming education and uh, apps and the internet doing that. Um, to me as an entrepreneur, that seems like that means that creates a lot of, uh, because you're creating infrastructure, essentially, uh, a lot of opportunities. So how do you see the educational opportunities? So if you're an educator, how could you use that big demand that doesn't currently um, use this technology um, as changing and transforming the educational experience? Maybe at first, well, I'm going to talk about India first before I come to other. It, it, it changes in, in, in big ways, and, and certainly the, the biggest way it changes in is that the number of students you can reach now changes. Uh, this is the whole concept of MOOCs, massive open online courses. Uh, you're not limited to the classroom. Uh, the best of the best lectures can be available to students around the world. Um, and learning changes from that perspective. Um, uh, I remember there's a New York Times reporter a few months ago uh, that wrote about how technology is changing education. And he said that uh, mediocrity in teaching is gone. I, I, in university, if the professor isn't great, the students just don't show up. Uh, it, it's, it's that straightforward. And, and professors know it. They know it within the first few days of class. When the class first day is 100 people, and by week two it's 20 people, uh, they should really be looking at what they're doing because students vote, by, well, I'm going to go online and have access to that content. Um, when when Sugata Mitra did these tests uh, in India, he did something called, he, he used to call it the, I think the nanny gram or something of that sort, uh, where he had these elderly retired ladies in the UK uh, teach English to these village kids in southern India. And it was very interesting because uh, you know, a few months into it, they not only had a great British accent, but they were speaking very good British Queen's English um, that they could have never learned uh, from teachers in that environment. So the, the quality and the level of education now changes instantly. Um, the, the kind of collaboration changes. Uh, you know, we, we came from a family that was relatively well off so even at young ages, we had access, access to tutors, right? That was a common thing. You'd have a tutor come home. You go to school all day, and in the evening, you have tutors. Um, uh, and uh, most students in India, of course, don't have access to that, except uh, we have an app on our device that creates a broad community of tutors, uh, and students pose problems, and t tutors answer those problems. So you don't need a live tutor sitting next to you. Uh, you. You can take your homework and start posting it up there <laughs> and have somebody else solve it for you if that's what you want. Uh, so you know, education uh, changes in, in many ways. And, and I think that it empowers both students and teachers uh, in ways that weren't possible before. Um, thank you. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, reverse innovation. And uh, I've been involved in a lot of projects that actually start in India around healthcare, for example, and because they are designed to meet a, uh, um, a t appropriate technology level rather than the best technology level. Um, how do you see that? I mean, uh, you've heard, we heard stories about you know, pizza delivery and things like this. How do you see the potential for bringing 
low-cost devices into the North American market? How, how is that going to change? Um, we had decided originally not to focus on these markets. We, we thought, hey, we've got our hands full in India. Uh, we, we just won't do a, a lot here. Uh, but you can't just launch in a market. You need technical support. You, 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 you need to get uh, uh, safety approvals and uh, you know, FCC type frequency approvals and things of that nature. And we had originally decided not to do anything here, except we started to get press coverage. And when we started to get, started to get press coverage, we got school boards like uh, Compton uh, in Southern California approaching us, saying uh, the LASD, the Los Angeles School District, has a billion dollar budget to hand out iPads. $800 per student is what they have available per, uh, to, to hand out. We have a budget for nothing. How do we do this? Um, Palo Alto is the largest concentration of tech billionaires in the world. Right across the train tracks is East Palo Alto with uh, a heavy Hispanic um, uh, immigrant community. 68% uh, dropout rates in high school of East, Al East Palo Alto. So we started getting high schools and, and schools, uh, both in Canada and uh, in the US, that started approaching us. And we started doing small pilots and we started putting some product with those. Uh, and then we started getting parents who saw their kids have them and said, hey, well, my kid goes to this school, so he has access to it, the other one that doesn't, and so on. So we, we finally decided to actually make our product at least available online. Um, and apart from the work we do with, with some school boards in North America, uh, we, we decided to make it accessible to consumers in the US, UK, and Canada. Um, you know, $38 Canadian, you can, or I think it's 42 the Canadian dollars drop, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, you can buy an entry-level tablet. Uh, we think it's still too high. Uh, you know, I, I think sub-20 is the right place to be before the end of the summer. But at the moment, you can't keep up with demand, so cracking the North American market is not the number one priority. Right. And that's one of the nice problems to have. It, it's still a problem. So uh, demonstrating that we're in a, in a business school, um, I have a few questions about, about business issues. So, so one of them was... Uh, you know, the company seems to be really, truly a multi-country. Multi so uh, biggest market, uh, most obvious target market is, is India. Seems to be a big base in, in the UK. Uh, you have manufacturing in India. Uh, you do some work in China and manufacturing in Montreal. Um, you chose to go listed in Toronto. So could you just talk about, number one, li listing in Toronto as an issue, and then number two, how did being, having that type of structure affect your ability to compete in the Indian market? So um, uh, Toronto, in many ways, was natural to us. Um, we, we've grown up in Canada. This is home. Um, you know, the core of the company, the R&D, is done here. Um, except from 2007 to 2014, we were officially a British company. We were a UK company. Uh, because of a structure under which we'd raised funding in the UK. Um, and somewhere in that time frame, we came across this company called Canaccord, uh, the investment banker that took us, took us public. Uh, and they had bought investment banking operations in the UK. So they're large operations in the UK, and the, they're a strong uh, uh, investment banker in, in Canada also. Um, and we started talking to them, originally with the idea of listing on the AIM stock market in the UK. Uh, we, in fact, even thought about uh, listing in India. And we thought, hey, here's a market where we have large retail appeal. Um, but we finally decided that we prefer a market that's a little quieter at this stage of the company, uh, that, that is a little bit under the radar. Um, and uh, Canaccord preferred the Toronto Stock Exchange. And uh, uh, realizing that we could do an IPO on this market with primarily a handful of institutional investors uh, and, and allow us to great grow to the sort of next stage without uh, a lot of exposure, which, which has its own drawbacks. Uh, but um, uh, the, you know, that was uh, uh, sort of the key motivator for us to do it here in Canada. So, so we always hear that Canadian institutional investors are very risk averse. Um, was that your experience, or did you find them to yeah. kind of see uh, the... Yeah, to, just to some degree, right? Uh, you know, certainly Canadian institutional investors have had exposure to mining companies in the developing world. 
uh, some negative exposure to mining companies also in the developing world. Uh, but I think that Canada has the advantage of a very sort of diverse group of immigrants, uh, diaspora from many parts of the world. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe we could have generated much more demand if we were sitting in India uh, for the stock. Uh, but uh, we generated enough demand. You know, this whole idea of being good enough, being, being able to reach your target was sufficient for us. So uh, we saw that there was enough demand for us to be able to do the IPO. Um, maybe not a lot of froth for it to go to astronomical levels after the IPO, but, but to us that was almost irrelevant because we got partners and investors on board who said, look, if this is going to be a multi-billion dollar hit and you're going to actually impact billions of people in their lives and so on, then we want to be here for the next five years and watch this ride happen versus watch either the stock day to day or you know, what happens quarter to quarter. Uh, and that appealed to us, that, that we would have investors who, who are willing to, uh, to, to stay there for, for a period of time. Now, uh, off, the, off the investors we talked to, as a percentage, how many came on board or how many didn't, I'm not sure. But enough came on board to allow us to do the IPO and raise the funding we needed and move forward. Um, there's a question that I really hate to ask, but um, it's one that's always asked um, about, about share price. And um, when you go public, all of a sudden, your share price changes every day. Uh, I think you had a good day on Friday last week. Um, do, you, do you watch the share price? Does it affect the business? Do you kind of spend lots of time having to explain it to other people? Or, you know, I, I used to be quite involved when I was at Waterloo with RIM, and they were banned from talking about the share price. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that, that issue? So and, and by the way, if anyone knows how to predict the share price in the future, please come and tell me, because I'd love to find out. <laughs> so so uh, if I told you that I don't watch it, that, then I'd be lying. Right? It's something that, that, that you end up looking at regularly and so on. Uh, do I have an opinion of where it should be or shouldn't be? Of course I do. Um, do I care that it's up or down at certain times? I don't. And the reason is that you care if this is the end game. You know, if, if this was sort of, uh, we, we've gone public and now that's it, we've exited. This is our exit strategy. Uh, in our case, that, that's certainly not the case. Um, our exit strategy uh, is not to come for some time yet uh, because we think that there's significant, significant growth opportunity uh, that's still unaddressed. And as a result, um, the, you know, the fluctuations of the stock price uh, are, are less relevant to us. Uh, sometimes we get criticized by uh, analysts or investment bankers saying, you know, we're not putting out enough news. Uh, we don't want to hype the stock. Uh, we'll put out news that's relevant when it, when it needs to be put out. Um, we had uh, lockups that expired uh, in early January. Uh, and we expected as lockups expire uh, for investors that had been private investors in the company um, seven years ago, that some of them will be looking for liquidity, and uh, that's the case, which has a negative impact on the stock. Mm -hmm. Does it impact the business of the company? Not at all. Uh, does it impact morale? I don't think so. Uh, certainly not in the short term. If we needed to be raising capital, I'd be a little bit more concerned about it. Um, but in this interim period, I, I'm, not, I'm not really concerned. Um, so there's a lot of interest in, in the, I mean, you chose the Indian market for a number of reasons, obviously <coughs> familiarity and, and passion for that market, and also because you'd observed at first hand some of the challenges of education there. Uh, but obviously there's other markets that, you know, have the same basic characteristics of, you know, limited education and they can't afford $600 tablets. Um, how are you prioritizing those other markets, especially given the fact that you're still trying to keep up with demand? What, what, you know, what are you going to do next, or what do you see next in terms of the trend? So, so for us, it, it's choosing the large markets. So in Latin America, it is Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia, the three largest markets. Uh, we've recruited staff in two of those markets. Uh, in Africa, although Nigeria is the largest market, we decided South Africa would be where we'd start. Uh, it'll give us access to all the southern African countries uh, because of English and because of common laws uh, that we have an easier time getting established. And in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia with over a couple hundred million people. 
So these are the countries that we've decided to actually position staff and specifically focus initially on uh, getting the deals done with the wireless operators. And over the next uh, quarter or so, we will get a number of these deals in place. Uh, and, um, and then we can look at actually launching in those countries. In, you know, in the interim, we sell in a variety of countries uh, that people uh, approach us for product from. Uh, UNICEF has been buying product in Nicaragua. Uh, there's a medical university uh, in uh, Ethiopia that has been buying product. Um, World Vision, we have a relationship with that, that, uh, that, that we get some product out with. Um, th there's a whole variety of uh, sort of governmental projects in Uruguay and uh, elsewhere uh, that uh, we supply to. Most of those we make almost no effort uh, to, to, to go approach and nurture and so on. Uh, so, you know, when the order comes to your, to, to your door and they're interested in buying product, uh, we, we certainly supply. Uh, but the markets that we will focus on uh, post India uh, will be the large uh, markets where internet penetration is low. Uh, Latin America, it will be Brazil, Mexico, Colombia. Uh, in um, Africa, we'll start with South Africa, but we will then spread ourselves around, and then Indonesia and Southeast Asia, um, and, uh, and, and then figure out how to, how to grow each of those markets. Um. I have to kind of ask an engineering question, and, and that's partly because of one of the comments you made in the workshop about uh, coming up with good ideas. So, you know, inherently, anyone could come up with an idea of having a, a $40, $35 tablet uh, that could do the things. Um, what do you think are the clever technology things that you've done that have enabled a complete device? Because the, the one thing that always surprised me, because again, I, I, was, I did this as part of my work at Waterloo, was how many different technologies were in a BlackBerry that enabled it to work. What are the clever things in, in your tablets that, that enable you to do things that other people really can't do? So a lot of it is about delivering the internet. A lot of it is how do you figure out how to get the internet into that environment, and not just low bandwidth environment, but low processing power environments. Yeah, the, the web browser is probably the most complex piece of software today on, on your desktop. Uh, and it's probably not just the most complex piece of software, it's probably the most poorly written piece of software uh, on your desktop. And um, it's not meant for mobile devices. Uh, the, the, the kind of experience that you get on, on a desktop uh, is not the same still today uh, as what you get in these mobile devices. And the technology we created really was this parallel processing uh, environment where we pre-process and pre-render a web page, then compress it, send it across. And uh, those algorithms uh, and, and that technology works really well um, in an environment where the bandwidth of the client side is very low. In fact, the very early on products we created uh, had 40 megahertz processors. So we were doing JavaScript and AJAX and really complex web renderings uh, on 40 megahertz processors uh, that, that people couldn't imagine. Uh, back then, six, seven years ago, those processors used to cost a couple of bucks. Uh, today, a 1.3 gig dual core processor costs three bucks. So, so you know the the dynamics have changed, but it, that was what allowed us to get to that uh, get to that level. And you know sometimes what also happens is that you've got to find solutions because you don't have a choice. Um, when we started in the UK, we had a fantastic Christmas in 2007, great sales. We were off to the races. We thought, hey, we can move this forward. 2008. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the issue that hit us was the financial markets around the world collapsed. And unfortunate uh, fact, by factor of that was that the company that used to supply us touch panels uh, also collapsed. Uh, and we were forced to develop our own touch panels. Uh, and, and that uh, gave us a significant strategic advantage. A million unit quantities out of China in that time was almost $17 uh, for a panel. We were making them in Montreal for two and a half bucks. Uh, you know, gave us a price advantage uh, and, and the ability to sort of kill that market uh, and drive pricing down in that market. Um, so uh, certainly the core of what we own as technology is this web delivery platform, but uh, creating these devices, um, uh, you know, they become more and more commodities. Um, and while we have some advantages, certainly with, with touch panels, uh, the price differential uh, continues to drop. 
So I have a, a question, obviously, from a budding entrepreneur about creating educational content. So, you know, if you were to kind of give advice about areas to look at for new, um, I'm going to call them applications, but I mean, that's a very broad term, that you think in, in these growing international markets that you're really creating, that areas that they, they may want to look at as opportunities. Do you, do you see any, like, gap, I mean, you're out there you're talking to people, do you see any specific gaps that you think people are not really addressing? There are lots of gaps. Uh, there are lots of gaps, especially in educational content. Um, one of the, uh, the biggest areas of educational content is um, uh, educational gaming, uh, is gamifying the educational process, creating a reward risk uh, kind of a scenario to give students uh, results and so on. Right? I get points for solving a problem and I sell more and more problems and I solve them before the clock runs down and, and so on. And, and there are interesting ways to create games for educational purposes. Unfortunately, nobody's done that and mapped it to anybody's curriculum all the way across. You know, I can find odd games here and there uh, to teach my kids about fractions or measurement or whatever else. But nobody's found uh, and actually created enough of them and mapped them to the curriculum saying, using this, I can take you from grade 1 math to grade 12 math, uh, or at least a long way along that. And I think that that is important, especially if you want to encourage self-learning, right? Um, you know, our kids are, are amazing at these, uh, uh, you know, well, these well, Halo-type other, other games and so on that they play. Um, and the, the amount of learning they have on those, right, if they could have on something more practical, uh, I, I think would be, would be very useful. So gamification of the educational model. And, and I think that mapping that to curriculum right. Right, is very important. So maybe there are some lessons for us to learn uh, even here. Um, we have five minutes left of, of questions. I'm going to go to old technology to give people that are, are not tweeting the chance. If there's any, I do have a couple more questions on Twitter, but if there's anyone with a, a question that would like to, to ask one, I'd be happy to take a couple. There's a lady at the back there. Uh, there's a microphone, just someone's walking up to you with Yes, uh, I wanted to just uh, a comment on something you said that sort of stopped me. Uh, when you said you uh, could ended up making the touch panels for two and a half dollars in Montreal, and they were 17 coming out of China, and I thought, well, that's, aside from all the interesting things I've heard tonight, I've, I thought that, that's like a headline. I mean, that's like globalization turned on its head, and I'd be interested in that and what the implications are you, you think are for that generally. So it, it wasn't, the issue wasn't that we were making it cheaper than China. The, the thing was that we were making it cheaper than what China was willing to sell it at. So, so you know, generally, uh, with, in every industry at any one time, there will be a mismatch in supply and demand. And till today, um, Almost all, you know, today on these kinds of devices, almost everything today is a commodity. Uh, microprocessor is three bucks. The guy who's making the microprocessor is barely making 15% gross margin. Uh, you know, the battery guy is making 5% margin. Uh, you know, all the components have become commodities. Um, and we believe that we've helped make the touch panels into a commodity. The LCD still isn't because you need to spend $100 million on a fab to be able to do that. But what it shows is that the moment any component requires a level of sophistication, then the margins are higher, and there's a supply-demand mismatch. Innovation still allows Canada to compete in a manufacturing environment. The, this perspective that people have, that manufacturing has gone to China and nobody else in the world will ever be able to compete, uh, I, I disagree with. Uh, you know, For years, uh, we had internal pressure to get out of the educational tablet business and be in the touchscreen panel business. Uh, except what I knew was that that supply demand gap will only last three or four years. And while I may have made some nice money in that process, I would have lost my focus of where you know, I really wanted to be. Uh, so, so certainly there's a lot of interesting and innovative stuff happening in Canada. Uh, and and you know, it's not unreasonable to expect that manufacturing can be done in, in Canada. Um, 
there is a you know there's an India Canada comprehensive free trade agreement that's been on the table for a few years now and hopefully it gets done at some point and you know our pitch to the Canadian government is it's good to get that done it'll help us you know make full units in Canada um, so thank you a very positive outlook I'm going to take one more question there was a gentleman I put his hand up and then I'm sorry but we'll have to wrap up so please for the last question you talked about uh, it's not about rediscovering the wheel <clears throat> So I would like to know, like, what advice you would like to give to a young entrepreneur uh, if he wants to work on the model which leverages on manipulating the weaknesses of the competitors? Is it smart to do so uh, while you're working on a startup, or what do you suggest? I, I, you know, um, I, I don't know that I look at opportunities from the perspective of weaknesses of competitors to start with, right? I first look at a point of pain, something that has a problem that hasn't been solved, right? Uh, and if it hasn't been solved, then, then the competitors are not solving it, right? Uh, and then I try to look at potential solutions and see if I can find a better solution than what else is out there. You know, can I deliver value to my customer? Uh, and and the, um, the Certainly, being able to survive competition is, is a, a critical part of being successful as an entrepreneur. Uh, but you know, it, it's something that comes way after the fact. The critical initial steps to me are, am I providing value to whoever I'm providing a product or service to? And then can I provide more value at a better price you know, uh, to that customer than anybody else out there? And as long as I can do that, then I've got a business. Um, the reason I asked that, that you know you but mentioned not having to necessarily reinvent the wheel, um, you know we, we, we live in a great society. We, we live in an environment where it, everybody has almost everybody has access to world class education. Uh, everybody has access or almost everybody has access to world class health, um, and everybody has a vote. Uh, you know uh, you can look like me and be a cabinet minister in Canada. Right? You, th there's very few other countries in the world where you can look like me and be a cabinet minister, right? or, or aspire to be the prime minister of this country. And um, it's important to take advantage of you know, understanding what's special about this place and seeing what happens if you apply that to other places. Um, in my opinion, there's some countries that will never be able to compete. Uh, Japan doesn't have the mix of what we have. You know, you just look at this crowd and the diversity of this crowd. Uh, countries that don't have that will never be able to compete with us. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of the strategic advantage. And figure out how to apply that to, to you know, uh, other places, parts of the world. Well, thank you very much for very optimistic statements. I'd like to ask uh, Dean Kaczynski to come up and say a few words of uh, thank you. Sunit, uh, thank you so very much for, for sharing your story with us. It's such a terrific story to tell, particularly to our um, students here. Thank you for, for showing them that, uh, that dreams are uh, not the things that you see in the sleep, that dreams are the very things that, which uh, uh, prevent you from sleeping and that you should never be afraid of dreaming aloud the way that you did and you empowered millions of children. Uh, you transferred knowledge to them, you made them more confident, and you made them believing in themselves. That's a great achievement, um, and we are really uh, very happy that you are our 2015 Mercia lecturer. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank you so much. Feels heavy. One, one last comment, perhaps, to, to our audience, um, because we will be hosting the 2016 uh, Mercier Lecture in our new engineering building. Um, it is uh, a building designed around the concept of flipping the classroom, which you have mentioned. That's the building with zero lecture halls. It, it was designed a way that uh, stimulates the collisions between students uh, and between students and, and professors. Uh, it will be very interesting uh, milieu. We hope that you all will be able to, to join us next year as well. Thank you so very much for spending time tonight. <laughs>